probe into the Trump campaign and its relation with Russia continues. We'll have the latest. Djibouti, a small African nation, yet of great importance to world powers. We'll explain why. Countries make improvements in collecting information and monitoring progress towards sustainable development goals. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin in North Africa, where Egyptian and Libyan warplanes reportedly launched more airstrikes against Islamic militants who murdered 29 Egyptian Christians last week. Witnesses say Monday's attacks targeted the Libyan city of Damna, where Egypt has the militants, have, uh, say the militants have camps. Now, Egyptian military officials have not confirmed Monday's attack. However, the Libyan spokesman said two groups affiliated with Al-Qaeda were the targets. Egypt's air force began attacking the camps Friday, just hours after militants rounded up Christians in the Egyptian province of Minya and opened fire, killing 29 and wounding 24. A governing Libyan faction in the east, allied with Egypt, is taking part in the airstrikes. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was in Cairo on Monday saying Moscow will back any initiative that will genuinely help in the fight against terrorism. He met with Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shokri, who said Cairo is closely coordinating with Russia in the fight, including stopping the terror financing and preventing countries from giving a safe haven to extremists. You know, in South Sudan, soldiers accused of raping at least five foreign aid workers and killing their local colleagues last year went on trial in a military court on Tuesday. Observers say it is a key test of the government's ability to prosecute war crimes. Between 15 to 20 government soldiers faced charges including murder, rape and looting during the attack on the Terrain Hotel in the capital Juba on July 11, 2016, according to Prosecutor Babakar Mohammed. UN investigators and rights groups have frequently accused both the army and the rebels of committing crimes since the civil war began in 2013 and say the crimes almost always go and punished. While killings, rape, mutilation, pillage and torture committed by successful governments and armed groups in the Central African Republic from the year 2003 to 2015 may constitute crimes against humanity, according to the United Nations. The UN report released on Tuesday is meant to help authorities identify cases as they establish a special criminal court to try the worst crimes committed in the uh, landlocked isolated nation. Now, repeated political crises in the CRR have fueled conflict since 2003. The price of violence is on the rise again, despite a successful presidential election last year. In the past two weeks alone, fighting between militia groups has killed about 300 people and displaced 100,000, the worst bout of displacement since 2013. The UN report says that perpetrators have enjoyed near total impunity throughout the period in question due to persistent insecurity and a weak justice system which has fueled cycles of abuse. While well, Djibouti is small and thinly populated, but it is location on the Horn of Africa gives Djibouti substantial importance and a number of major nations want a military presence there. Now, VOA senior analyst Jeffrey Young has details. In real estate, a property's value is usually tied to its location, location, and those with prime property usually extract that value. Such is the power held by Ishmael Omar Gele, president of Djibouti, a small 23,000 square kilometer state on the Horn of Africa. Djibouti's location at the Red Sea's southern exit at the Bab al Mandab and the Gulf of Aden places it next to some of the world's most important shipping lanes. Its proximity to Yemen and Somalia make it a key location for operations against Al Qaeda, Al Shabaab, and other terrorist groups. Djibouti has also been a stable base for fighting piracy in the Indian Ocean. Retired U.S. Ambassador David Shin, who has served in Djibouti, lists the many countries that have a military presence in this strategically critical former French colony. Djibouti is a very small country with a significant number of, of military forces from different countries there. The French have been there the longest. Uh, currently have about uh, 1,450 personnel. The Americans are the largest group, mainly for counterterrorism. The, uh, the Japanese are there with a small, relatively small naval contingent. 
The Chinese are putting a facility in, uh, which will be a sizable facility once it's done later this year. And the Saudis have signed an agreement to also establish a military facility in, uh, in Djibouti. Camp Lemonnier hosts all but the Chinese. The United States moved into the long-standing French base in 2003 to conduct post-9-11 operations against terrorism. This is U.S. Africa Command, or AFRICOM's, only permanent base in Africa, with some 4,000 people from all branches of the U.S. military. U.S. UAV drones at Camp Lemonnier became visible in 2011 used in attack and reconnaissance operations against terrorists in Yemen and Somalia. In September 2013, U.S. drone operations left Camp Lemnia for a remote inland facility in the desert called Chalabi Field. This provided both greater privacy and relief from the growing congestion on Lemnia's runways. North of Chalabi Field and west of Camp Lemnia, the Chinese Navy is completing construction of a military and commercial port facility, its first base outside of the People's Republic. The move is seen as part of Beijing's global geopolitical strategy, as told by research organization American Enterprise Institute analyst Catherine Zimmerman. What hasn't really gone noticed is that not only have the Chinese started to to build the space next to the U.S. military base inside of Djibouti, but they've also bought land elsewhere, such as in Australia, that's next to a U.S. naval base. And it seems to be a way that the Chinese are starting to parallel our efforts across the world. Countries pay fees for such military basing rights. For Djibouti's now four-term president, Ismail Omar Ghele, the fees have paid off handsomely says Atlantic Council analyst Bronwyn Bruton. I have heard that the U.S. spends approximately, you know, 65 million a year on Camp Lemonnier, that the Chinese spend approximately 100 million a year on their naval base. Um, I've heard that the Japanese are spending about a million for their much, much smaller facility. I don't know what the French are spending, but I would probably guesstimate somewhere in the realm of, you know, 25 million perhaps. President Gele might think he could keep hiking these annual fees, but Ambassador David Shin says the sky may not be the limit. He has to be careful with that. Uh, not that they're going to be wanting to move out or find some other place to go. That would be very hard to do. But if he, if he overplays his hand on that one, um, there will be, I think, pushback from all of the actors who are there today. Still, at any price, there's no place like Djibouti. Jeffrey Young. VOA News. Well, U.S. Senator John McCain said on Monday he views Russia and its President Vladimir Putin as the greatest challenge we have beyond even that posed by the Islamic State terrorist group. Now, during a visit to Australia, McCain told the Australian broadcasting company Putin has tried to destroy the very fundamental of democracy with efforts to influence the U.S. presidential election. I have seen no evidence they succeeded, but they, they tried, and they are still trying. They are still trying to change elections. They just tried to affect the outcome of the French election. So um, I've, I view Vladimir Putin, who has dismembered Ukraine, a sovereign nation, who is putting pressure on the Baltics. I view the Russians as, a far, as the far greatest challenges that we have. Well, the comments come as President Donald Trump's administration faces investigations into whether it had links to Russia, including reports that Jared Kushner, his son-in-law and a senior White House advisor, attempted to establish a back-channel communications link to Russian officials in the weeks before Trump's inauguration. My view of it is I don't like it. I, I just don't. I don't. I know that... Some administration officials are saying, well, that's standard procedure. I don't think it's standard procedure prior to the inauguration of a president of the United States by someone who is not in an appointed position. Well, the White House is bracing uh, for the upcoming congressional testimony of former FBI chief James Comey. Trump fired Comey after allegedly asking him to draft the probe into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn and his close ties to the Kremlin. Trump has rejected any allegations that his campaign colluded with Russia. 
Now going to Europe, France's new president, Emmanuel Macron, hosted his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, at the Palace of Versailles near Paris on Monday. In what he called extremely frank direct talks, Macron criticized Russian media outlets for efforts to influence the French presidential election. He also questioned brutal treatment of the gay and lesbian community in Chechnya and Russia's role in eastern Ukraine and Syria. Viewers, Ladit Sahok reports. Macron chose the grandeur of Versailles for his first face-to-face -face talks with Putin. In the opulence of the royal palace, he raised uncomfortable issues, such as the Russian media's coverage of his election campaign. Macron accused two influential outlets of attempting to influence the French election in favor of his rival, Marine Le Pen, who has been friendly with Putin. Ce sont des Russia Today and Sputnik have been organs of influence throughout the campaign, and they have repeatedly produced counter-truths about me and my campaign. Rights groups have urged Macron to confront Putin about the abuse of gays and lesbians in Russia's southernmost Chechnya region. Mr. Macron promised it was a commitment he made to Amnesty International during the campaign that he would defend human rights not only in France but in the world. So here he has an opportunity that must not be missed to show extreme firmness because we know that's the only language Mr. Putin understands. After the talks, Macron made clear that he had kept that promise. We discussed the case of LGBT persons in Chechnya but equally the case of the NGOs in Russia. On these subjects, I very precisely indicated to President Putin France's expectations. The French president also criticized Russia's military interventions in Syria and eastern Ukraine. For his part, Putin called for an end to Western sanctions against Russia. I appeal to you, as well as to the representatives of the French media, you should fight for the lifting of all restrictions in the global economy. Only the lifting of all restrictions to free market and free competition, fair and free of political interests and opportunistic instruments, can help the development of the world economy, contribute to fighting unemployment, and increase the quality of life for our citizens. Russia has been under international sanctions for its illegal annexation of Ukraine's Crimea Peninsula in 2014 and its military support for Russian-speaking separatists in eastern Ukraine. In Syria, Russia supports the government of President Bashar al-Assad in its bloody campaign to subdue the opposition. Zlariza Hok, VOA News, Washington. One of Korea's uh, state-run news agency says the country's latest ballistic missile test was a success and involved a new precision guidance system. In neighboring South Korea, the military said Monday's test involved a SCAR-type missile that landed about 450 kilometers off North Korea's east coast in the Sea of Japan. The test, the third in as many weeks, uh, came just uh, days after world leaders at the G7 Economic Summit demanded Pyongyang give up its nuclear ambitions. Now, the North Korean state news service KRT announced the launch in a Tuesday broadcast. The current test fire was aimed at verifying the technological aspects of the new type precision guided ballistic rocket, enabling it to make an ultra precision strike on enemy's objects in any area. The test also examined the reliability of operating a Caterpillar self propelled launching pad vehicle, which was newly designed and produced in different battle conditions. The test was conducted by firing at a middle shooting range for a precise remote observation of the last guidance stage of the warhead. Well, the U.S. Pacific Command said it tracked what appeared to be a short-range ballistic missile for six minutes and determined it did not pose a threat to North America. U.S. President Donald Trump said on Twitter, North Korea has shown great disrespect for their neighbor China by shooting off yet another ballistic missile. But Trump gave China credit for trying hard to rein in North Korea's military ambitions. China has repeatedly said it views dialogue as the path to resolving the standoff of North Korea's nuclear program. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54. The stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Now coming up, countries make improvements in collecting information and monitoring progress towards sustainable development goals. Stay with us.
news and notes. This is Living Better. And if you can drug it, then you can bring the potential or the health benefits of exercise to people who can't exercise. That's Professor Ronald Evans at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, where scientists are working on an exercise pill, a chemical compound called GW1516 that tells the body to turn carbohydrates into energy and also to burn fat. You can keep going on fat uh, for a long time as long as you can keep the sugar going to the brain. The researchers say that mice tested on the compound were able to run 100 minutes longer after getting the pill. And even mice who weren't exercised showed signs of better health from the drug. Evans says clinical human trials for the pill could begin within a year and that it could bring valuable benefits to the elderly, obese, or those with conditions that prevent them from exercising. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. I'm Jeff Selden, and I work the National Security Beat. National Security Beat is anything that affects the national security of the United States, from counterterrorism to surveillance to even relations with Russia. It's one of the most fascinating beats you can have. It's probably one of the more important beats that you can cover because it touches on so many areas of the world, so many areas of people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm Jeff Selden, and my beat is national security. Welcome back. Now, new data from the World Health Organization highlights improvements uh, countries have made on collecting vital statistics and monitoring progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Lenore Madu has more. In its annual World Health Statistics, the World Health Organization says almost half of all deaths globally are now recorded with a cause. The publication provides a snapshot of both gains and threats to the health of the world's people. The report shows that while the quality of health data has improved significantly in recent years, many countries still do not routinely collect high-quality data. We need to have data collection in order to know what's going on with health. And we found that more than half of deaths in the world aren't recorded with information on cause of death. Of the estimated 56 million deaths globally in 2015, 27 million were registered with a cause of death. In 2005, only about a third of deaths had a recorded cause. Several countries have made significant strides towards strengthening the data they collect, including China, Turkey, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. Incomplete or incorrect information on deaths that are registered also reduce the usefulness of those data for tracking public health trends, planning measures to improve health, and evaluating whether policies are working. What can be done to improve it? First, there needs to be bureaucratic systems in place, and uh, those take years to build up. So it's a major investment and takes quite a bit of political will to put death registration uh, into practice. Uh, the second thing that needs to be in place is there needs to be uh, medical doctors to identify the cause of death. And when there are insufficient medical personnel, it's not possible to record a cause of death. The data on progress towards universal health coverage show that globally, 10 measures of essential health service coverage have improved since 2000. In the last 15 years, life expectancy has increased by about five years, and that increase has been greater in sub-Saharan Africa. Universal health coverage is the cornerstone of uh, the method towards achieving or improving health, um, and uh, we're monitoring the two main dimensions of UHC, sorry, universal health coverage. Uh, one is coverage of health services, and we have found that that's improving in the world. Access to services is just one dimension of universal health coverage. In addition, Dr. Stevens says how much people pay out of their own packets for those services is critical. He says in data from 117 countries, about 9.3% of people are still spending more than 10% of their household budget accessing care, a problem that needs to be addressed. Lenore Mudu, VOA News, Washington. Well, doing business in unfamiliar territory can be tricky. And for any business partnerships to thrive, there has to be trust on both sides. Africa 54's Estegido, what tells us about that type of business arrangement? 
Sub-Saharan Africa Chamber of Commerce organization was founded eight years ago and is based in the U.S. The organization's president, Christine Marte Ochola, says the chamber supports both U.S. and African businesses in establishing partnerships and has offices in Nairobi and Johannesburg. And so what the chamber actively does on a day-to-day -day basis is identify who are viable partners. We work with our companies to support that identification to support the communication to very specific sectors. There seems to be some sort of fear of the unknown from potential investors right. in Africa and companies in Africa right. that are not quite sure how the partnership is going to play out. How do you verify who is legitimate mm -hmm. on both sides of the aisle? We lean a lot on our local partners, but we also lean a lot on, our, like I said, the U.S. Commercial Service on the African side because they also have resources to help in verification. Now, the other way around, we do the same thing. In spite of the many business partnerships that are doing well between Africa and outside investors, Ochola acknowledges that the perception of risks on both sides still persists. For example, U.S. Uh, companies will say that, you know what, we think there's a lot of corruption in Africa, and what if we send our things there and these guys don't pay us back and we'll be out of our product, plus we'll be out of our money. Well, you know what, the same thing is happening to African companies, and we have actually found ourselves in a space where we are trying to get the U.S. companies to pay the African companies because these guys have not paid. China is investing heavily in Africa, and some economic experts say the U.S.-Africa trade is somewhat lagging behind, but Ochola sees it differently. Africa is investing heavily in Africa, but partnering with China. And why do I say that? Because the Chinese will come into the country with their money and say, we will develop these roads for you, but you pay us back in 30 years. Who's paying back? The continent is paying back. If we talk about companies such as Merck that have set up packaging facilities in South Africa, or in Kenya, or we have uh, U.S. companies that have set up a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility in Nigeria. To me, that's investment because a company has vested in establishing something, in hiring people, right, manufacturing, so creating jobs. They might be exporting their stuff out, but they're certainly leaving some value on the ground. How is the economic climate in Africa and which way should investors and even local businesses be channeling their energy? For an investor, look at what's going on in the given country. And if there's too much ripple on the political side, and if there's a lot of dysfunction within the governance sector, then you might want to hold off a little bit. If, for example, one wants to enter the renewable energy market, we know that Morocco is doing really well with wind. We know that Rwanda is also doing wind. We know Kenya is doing geothermal. Namibia is looking at solar. Togo is looking at solar. Look at the sectors that Africa actually wants. And her advice to Africans in the diaspora who want to invest in the continent? I've found that the diasporans who've been successful, they're ones who have said, OK, do we have a lawyer? Do we have an accountant? Do we have a business that was registered that is actually paying taxes and so on? Ochola says for African countries to tap the diaspora capital, governments should create tax regulations and a judicial system that works to protect diaspora investment in their native countries. Esther Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, investing in the preservation of a world heritage site in northern Ethiopia. We'll be right back. Just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headline. The United Nations says that abuses and violence committed by armed groups in the Central African Republic from 2003 to 2015 may constitute crimes against humanity. In Morocco, youth demonstrate in the city of Al Hosseima after the arrest of the fugitive leader of a protest movement. In the Mediterranean, Portuguese and Spanish rescuers saved 34 migrants who leaped into the sea after their inflatable craft caught fire. 
In Nigeria, Biafran separatists mark 50 years to the day since an independent Republic of Biafra was declared, sparking a brutal civil war. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Well, protecting a nation's natural biodiversity takes more than designating a parcel of land and national park. Uh, investing in business and education is helping preserve a world heritage site in northern Ethiopia. Faith Lapidus reports. With its jagged peaks and deep valleys, Simeon Mountains National Park has been called the Grand Canyon of Africa. Its importance to Ethiopia cannot be overstated. It's an ecological phenomenon for the country. It's a world heritage site as well. So it's important to Ethiopia, it's important for Ethiopia's economy, it's important to the global community. Tourists come to see the native wildlife, like baboons and ibex, some of the rarest animals in the country. And that brings needed money to the local economy. But the park's biodiversity is threatened by the growing human population. So the African Wildlife Foundation began investing in businesses around the park like a boutique tourist lodge. Part of its profits support a school the foundation built as part of its socio-economic strategy. Our program is to help inspire um, conservation through education. So the school, Adiske Primary School, is going to act as a gateway for conservation um, for the community. So first we, we, we build the infrastructure, the, the actual school itself, to provide um, access to more quality education. And then the long-term impact of, the, of our program comes with programs such as conservation education, teacher training. The conservation class teaches students the benefits of the park's wildlife and the importance of protecting it. <laughs> The program is an investment in the future of the people, their economy, and their park. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, on that's our show for today. Thanks a lot for watching, and have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. Most people enjoy listening to music. But is this expression actually about songs and tunes? Music to my ears. Jonathan, I cannot believe we have to work over the weekend. Did you not hear the news? The meeting for the project got canceled. No work this weekend after all. Awesome! That is music 